So, Father, we thank you for your word. Because we know that, God, your word, it has life. And whatever you wanted to accomplish, it will accomplish that. And we give you thanks now and everybody say, Amen. I ask the question, are we compromising with God's word? Are we compromising with God's word? To compromise is to make concessions or accommodations for someone who does not agree with a certain set of standards or rules. When you think of it, that there are times we need to compromise. If you are married and a month has passed, you will understand clearly what I'm saying. We need to compromise. It's not a fight. It's not who is right from who is wrong. There are times you know you're right, but for peace sake, you got to give it up. And sometimes when you, in that first month, two months, you don't want to give up nothing, but you got to compromise. And it's very important. Sometimes on our jobs, we have to do it, give up certain things. But when you look at the book of Daniel, when they were in captivity in Babylon, they made a bargain with the chief eunuch because they're supposed to eat what was provided for them, but they came to what? They compromised. The eunuch compromised with them, and he said, okay, all right, you'll eat the vegetables, drink the water, and we will see what will happen. So there is a place for us to compromise, but we also must understand that the Bible makes it clear that God does not condone compromising his word. He is really serious about that. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 32. Hear what he says. Be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right nor to what? To the left. The Psalms 119 and verse 3, this is from another translation. And it said, joyful are those who do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his paths. We cannot afford to compromise with the word of Almighty God. Amen. We can't afford to do that. I don't know if you ever heard this illustration but there was a guy who um, decided he wanted to fight during the Civil War. And what happened? He couldn't decide whether he would like to fight for the North or the South. So what he did, he put on a jacket, which looked like the army suit for the North. And then he put on a pants that looked like the South suit. And what it has happened, when he went out in battle, both sides fired at him. We have a problem, church. We cannot afford to compromise. It puts you in a serious problem. The word of God is clear. And sometimes I know we might be saying, but there are times the interpretation of the word is a problem. I hear all that, but God's word is explicit. God's word is clear. That's why I always say we need to be in the house of the Lord. We need to be in the Bible studies so that we can understand the word of God so we will not compromise with God's word. And so when you look at it, Jesus speaks to the church. And let us hear what he says. Most Bibles, most translations, uh, uh, most commentaries describe this church as a compromising church. Firstly, we must understand this. We must listen to the speaker. The one who is in charge of the church. And that is Jesus Christ. 
When he is speaking, we must listen to what he is saying. He that hath an heart and ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is doing. What? It's saying to the church. Pergamum was a thriving ancient Greek city, and it was taken over by the Romans. And what happened, they, they said that what was unique about this city, they had a 200,000 volumes library. It was a huge thing. It was a, a wonder at that time. And so here is it, I'm told that the Bible said historically, historically they had this, but then what happened, Christ possesses the sharp two-edged sword because that library did not say anything about Jesus Christ. There were no books written there about Christ. And so what happened now, Jesus, the Bible said, and the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things say he who has the sharp to edge sword. Now, you've got to understand this. The Romans used a sword, a romphia. They called it typically implying a large broad sword. That was used by the Roman soldiers. And this is a weapon of offense. <laughs> you mean, you know, it, it, it was a terrible sword. It can divide, it can cut people, you know, it can do a lot of dangerous things. That sword. And the Romans possess that. But Jesus Christ comes now. <laughs> and he said, look, listen, you have that sword. <laughs> but I have a more effective sword. You see what happened? That sword can only slay those who are uh, alive or, or it can only kill, those, um, kill people physically. But the sword that I have uh, can kill and slay spiritually. And let me tell you something. That's the most dangerous sword. Hmm. Hallelujah. And this sword that he has... Uh, Oh, hallelujah, can divide, can separate, can stand up to any false doctrine that is in the world today. That sword is a powerful sword. And so Jesus' words are able to pierce paganism and destroy the works of Satan. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. They had a large sword. They had a sword that can slay men. But listen, the word of God is powerful. The word of God can cripple any person. The word of God can penetrate the hearts and lives of men. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Kings heard the word of God and they were moved. Some of us in our rebellious state, we heard the word of God and we were moved. Oh, the word of God, we're through the power of the Holy Ghost. It is powerful. Listen to the speaker. Secondly, he commends the church. Verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. I know it. Where they lived, they were faithful. And I like it when Christ commends the church. They held fast to Christ's name even though they lived in Satan's stronghold. Think of this for a moment. The people of Pergamum worship Zeus. There was a temple there, the chief god of the Olympian gods. Not only that, they worshipped the Roman Empire. That's why the church, the Christians, were persecuted. Because why? They believed that their emperors were gods. So you have to worship Caesar. You have to worship them. And the church was saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. We serve one god. 
So they didn't like that. So you had the, the call of the Olympic uh, Olympian gods. You had the Roman emperors. And you also had gods like Dionysus. And you had the god of vegetation. You had the god of healing. You had other gods uh, that they would worship. And Jesus is saying, man, you had all this. Still, you didn't worship. You didn't bow down. Also, he commends them for this. They held fast to their faith in Christ. Even when Antipas was martyred because of his faithfulness, they continued to uphold the name of Jesus Christ. One of their faithful men, he was martyred. And you think it will affect the church, but it did not affect the church. Instead, they stood up. Woo! Hallelujah. That is great. I mean, just reading that, you are excited about this church. That they had so many gods that they could have worshipped. But they chose to worship the one and only God. And not only that, someone from among them were martyred. They should have been scattering, take their luggage and run out to that place. But instead of that, they made a stand. Just on that alone, man, I would feel excited about this church. But you see, there's a word that when Jesus used that, it, it gets to me. Nevertheless, I don't like that word when I see it. It's almost like somebody talking to you, and when they talk to you, they say, but. I don't, I don't like that word too much. You see, because what is happening now, his, he is expressing his disapproval of the church. He commends the church. Church, you, you have done this and you have done the other. Woo, that's very good. But nevertheless, his disapproval of the church and this he disapproved of their doctrine. The congregation, well, uh, the Bible said in the congregation, there was an undermining influence of those holding fast to the teaching of Balaam. You see, brethren, what the enemy is doing today, you know, when I was growing up, people would always talk about um, they, they felt someone choking them and suppressing them. Always seeing somebody in black coming into their rooms. And sometimes as a little boy, you're shaking like a leaf. You get into church and you want to pray. And one eye open and one eye closed. Because you're saying to yourself, I don't want this black person. But now you're not hearing about that. What the enemy is doing, yes, some of us, we are faithful to God. We are making a stand. But what he is doing, he's coming at us with our belief. Let me tell you something, church. We are in a situation now that we accept things as long as we feel good about it. Come on, that's terrible. The word of God can stand on its own. The word of God doesn't want an organ music attached to it. The word of God can stand on its own. And we should embrace it and let it be a part of our lives. I've read books. I've seen books already. They tell you if you want to. Manipulate the feelings of people, paint the church a certain color, put the flowers in a certain place, do this and do that. I don't have to manipulate people's feelings. Hallelujah. When we get in contact with the word of God and the Holy Spirit ministers to our lives, something happens on the inside. Balaam was hired. To do a job. Balaam was the prophet for profit. He was hired to do a job by Balak the Moabite. Balak wasn't stupid. Balak saw the trend. The trend of Israel were conquering nations. And he knew it's just a matter of time. They come in for Moab. 
So he hired the prophet Balaam and said, come and curse the people. I mean, this guy, I, I really have to look at it. Something was really wrong with this guy. You are a prophet. Come on. You are a prophet and now you are going to curse God's people for a prophet. And so the Bible said three times he went. And Balak was mad with him because why? Every time he got there, he blesses the people. The man is stupid, you know. God said, you can't curse my people. You got to bless them. But what happened now is that Balak, Balaam told Balak, and you see it here in Numbers 31 from verse 15 to 16. Hear what the Bible said. And Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? The instructions were to the Israelite army, wipe out everybody. So Moses said to them, have you kept all the women alive? And verse 16, look, these women caused the children of Israel to sin through the counsel of what? Balaam. So Balaam realized every time he went to curse the people, he had to bless them. So his advice to Balak was, let them intermarry. And oh, it was a successful plan. The Bible said, I believe in, in Numbers 25, something like 24,000 people, men, lost their lives. God wiped them out. And so this is what the enemy is doing in so many cases because Balaam's teaching was to get Israel to fail, to get Israel to mess up. And let me say to you this morning that the purpose of what the devil is doing today is to get the church to mess up. Oh man, hallelujah. He's not going to do certain things. I remember we were in Bible school and, 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 and one of the guys, he was reporting, it was um, breakfast and, and he was saying to us, he said, boy, I had an experience last night. I said, what, what, what happened? He said, there was a guy, we used to call him man of prayer or man of war or something like that. And he said, I was coming down off the top bunker and I just touched man of war bed. And the man get up in Jesus' name. I come against you, devil, I bind you everything. The devil knows uh, if he launch a frontal attack, uh, we're going to make a stand. Come on, church. Uh, we're going to make a stand. Uh, and I bind you in the name of Jehovah. We're going to come against it. So he comes uh, in a subtle way. Oh, man, he's coming like that. And the church must be able to detect what is happening. Sometimes we, in a subtle way, accept certain teachings from the word of God because, quote unquote, those who look strong in the faith, accepting it. I remember reading this. It was in a, I think was one of those magazines or something I received. And so it was all over the internet. A pastor was saying, he said, I am going to be thrown out from my organization. Why? Because years ago, I preached against the homosexual lifestyle, men marrying men. But I just came from a marriage where my son was married to a guy, and now I am in approval of it. And so there are times, church, uh, what happened, we look at others. Uh, and this is not a time uh, for us to look at others. We need to look at the Word of God. We understand the whole thing of being an example. And praise God, we must be an example. But when the example fail, uh, I am not going to fail. Uh, when the example fail, uh, I will still uh, focus uh, on the Word uh, of God. I wouldn't leave the person right there. Try to encourage them in the ways of God. Get up from your situation. Get up from where you're going. But it doesn't matter who fails, who falls apart. I serve a God. If because you fail, that doesn't mean that I have to fail. My focus is on Christ. My focus is on God. And those who we may look at and they seem to know what they're about, if they have shifted, brother, you have shifted. Sister, you have shifted. But I will continue serving my God. Yeah. 
so often we shift our teaching because it's convenient. I was reading some statistics. I, I couldn't bring that. I couldn't put it because it's a bit long. Where they're saying teenagers at a certain age, they're leaving the church because they fear that what the church is saying is not meeting their needs. That might be true in some cases, but come on, what do you want? Come on, the power of God can transform and change. What do you want? Come on, we come on a Sunday morning and play hopscotch. I don't even know how you. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. There are times based on the word of God. Because sometimes we are so hard and fast. That we don't want to shift certain things. And it would not compromise the word of God. But sometimes people are asking you to move this out of the word. Move that. That thing that you uh, uh, all said the word stands for. Get rid of that. No. We cannot do that. Uh, because it's God's word. It's all about putting stumbling blocks before people. The doctrine, and I pronounce it as the Nicolaitans, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans were that you can live a Christian life and sin as much as you want. And there are some people there like that. They say, look, listen, I want to serve God. I want to walk in the ways of God. But I must do what I want. Let me tell you something. When you are in touch with God, when you know you have surrendered your life to God and you have walked into a relationship with God, one of the things you want to do is please Him. Amen. Pastor Higgy said once he did, there was a rock concert. And he said, let me see if I can walk in the rock concert. Dressed with his jeans pants on. And if you know him, he has, a, he has some size. So I don't know what size was that jeans pants. Had the jeans pants on, put on a sneakers, and kind of ruffled his hair and walked into the, the, the place. And when he met the guy by the door, he said, Pastor, where are you going? said, when I heard that, I just turned around and went back home. It was D.L. Moody who said this, Christians should live in the world, but not be filled with it. A ship lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, what happens? It goes under. Oh, man. We cannot live that kind of life. We are in this world and God is keeping us and strengthening, strengthening us. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something, brethren. When we get in contact with God, when we get in touch with God, it's at that time we realize how sweet he is. Sadly, a lot of people don't want that. They want to go to church when they find time. One person said to the pastor, Pastor, why every time I come to church you are singing the same songs? And the pastor told him, you must stop coming to church only on Christmas Day. <laughs> Some people, they want to go to heaven, but they still want to live their sinful life. Let me say this to you, brethren. It is so sad, and I must tell you, that you want to find a preacher to endorse or people to endorse every sinful thing you can find them. But is that the word of God? No. That's why we got to know what God's word is saying to us. Hallelujah. It's not how the organ makes you feel. There are some people, if current were to go, they cannot worship God. Come on. I was in the day when we had to light candles. Sometimes electricity is gone. And oh my, if the tambourines could have cried, they would have cried. We used to put some blows on those tambourines. Bata, ta, pa, 
tongue. <laughs> Sometimes the skin will burst. Because why? We enjoyed being in the presence of God. At that time, we didn't have the drum set and the organ. But listen, we magnified the name of the Lord. Don't get me wrong. If we have it, let's use it. But come on, that should not be always the platform that I have to use to worship God. When you sit down and you open the word of God and you see what the word of God is saying to you. Sometimes reading it, even the hair on your skin. Oh my God, you get goosebumps just reading the word of God. It does something to the inner man. So hear what he commands the church. Repent. Or else I would come quickly. Judgment day would not be a man sitting on that seat. It would be God himself. You see, we have got to understand the detriment of compromising is great. When we compromise, it poisons our witness, our testimony. <clears throat> Think of it for a moment. A compromised church is really a dying church. That church can't go anywhere. That church will not be effective in the community. Not only that, no one takes compromising Christians seriously. You go with guys and drinking, what's the latest they have now? Can't say vodka, vodka is Russian. What's the latest now? Campari? Campari still still around? I heard about that. Um, and they have Johnny Walker Ice. I heard that one recently. John, oh, sorry, Johnny Walker Blue. I thought it was Ice. Blue, they have them. And you could sit down and clack and hit the glasses with your bodies. Woo! And behave. And then the next time you come back and tell them Jesus loves you. Tell me how serious they're going to take you. <laughs> you at work and you compromise with your speech, gossiping, knifing everybody. And then you come back and say, Woo, I had a service on Sunday. God is good. When we compromise, our testimony is compromised. And when it is compromised, you don't even want to be in an open air. I mean, <laughs> growing up, some of us, we really, you see, when you're young, you really have to forgive us. And I had to say many times to God, God, please forgive me. Don't judge me for what I did as a teenager. But I know some guys, sometimes the church would have a match. And what I noticed, because we had the drum set on a truck and we moving around and, and declaring the name of Jesus. And I noticed some guys, when you are passing in, on their street, they are missing in action. Sometimes they want to ride in the truck and they duck in behind the drum and he's saying, but what's going on here? What are you doing there? And then after you pass their area, they jump out and they... <laughs> compromise poisons our hearts. You see, sometimes we compromise because we want to be a people pleaser. I want to act one way in the community, act one way in the job, act one way in the church. But who should I be pleasing? It's God. I'm not saying be an antagonist. I'm not saying you get on your job and you're cussing everybody. No. If possible, the Bible says live at peace. With what? With all men. But come on. I'm not going to compromise my testimony with others. Three challenges for the believer. Ground your life in God's truth. That's how we're supposed to live our lives. In God's truth. And live to please God. And doing that at times, people will be angry with me, but I can't help it. The apostles did that. 
Many times they were beaten. Stop speaking about this name. And they say, hey, we rather listen to him than listen to you. And not only that, embrace being different. Oh my God, hallelujah. I am a child of the king. Now I'm not telling you, I've got to put balance to these things. When I'm at work and hallelujah and shout down the people play. No man, I enjoy being different. Hallelujah. I am a child of God. Oh man, I will pray when they say certain things. I am blessed. That's the part I would use it. And I'm not stressed. I am so thankful every day to be a child of the king. One guy said when he's coming to church, he would take the Bible and push it under his, under his shirt. I don't want to offend anybody, Pastor. I don't want nobody to know that I'm a child of God. You're going to be crazy, man. I know what Christ uh, has done for me. Uh, I know where he has brought me from. Uh, and what are you telling me? Hide Bible until I reach the church. No, I put the Bible on my chest. See, brethren, we can compromise with the tires of the church. I can call you and say, what do you think? You think we should move this? And you say, let's say we have 100% here, 50 or 60% say, no, pastor. We could compromise on that. I can ask you what color you think we should paint the church. And some of you might say, pastor, let me just paint over this. No problem. We can sit down in our homes and say, look, we're going to order a car online. Which one you think is good? I like Honda and the three like Suzuki. All right. Compromise. But we have got to understand as a church, we cannot compromise the gospel. So I am not going to have a meeting with you and say, what do you think we should preach? The day you hear me say that, something is drastically wrong. Amen. I'm not going to ask you for that. I'm not going to ask you, what are the things we should teach not to offend people? You're not going to hear me asking you that question. <laughs> we cannot compromise on moral issues. I am not going to come to you and tell you, what you think? You Should we marry two men, two women? Should we stop preaching about fornication and adultery? I wouldn't come to you and ask that. And if you come to me and say, Pastor, we need to raise that in the church because we need to do that, I will start praying. God, open that person's eyes and tell them you need to repent. I know that might sound a little harsh because some people have issues. I get that. But I would want to have a discussion. I am not going to bring those things to you as a church. But we must ask ourselves a question. Ah, uh, the question, are we compromising with the word of God? We must listen to the speaker. The speaker commends the church and his disapproval of the church, what they believe. And finally, his command to the church, get it right. Get it right. Repent quickly, because I'm going to deal with you. Brethren, it is God's church. It is not our church. And I am comforted by the fact, the scripture says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Didn't say maybe. Some translations, I believe it's one of the Bibles, they have left that out because they feel it was added. But honestly, when you look at it, it's consistent. With a lot of things that is happening in the word of God. Saul went to persecute the Christians. And a light shone around him. And God said, hey. Paul, what you, Saul, what you're doing there is not mine. This is God's church, Jesus. And I'm going to stand for him. He saved me. He washed me in his blood. And I'm grateful for that. And so what happened? We will stand up on his word. Doesn't matter who gets angry, say what. I don't know if some of you, and I'm going to close on this, if you saw what happened in Barbados, and, and it, was, it was just moving around the, 
the um, Facebook, someone sent me twice, two persons, what happened in Barbados. A guy just ran into the church and started breaking pews. Pastor had blood on his shirt, don't know what happened. It was a frightening experience. And people are asking, what's going on now? Yes, we know it was one incident. But I want to put, put it to all of us. Are we willing to stand up for the word of God? Because when you see what is happening on the horizon, people are asking the church to compromise. To compromise. And, and I want to make it clear before I close. I know we grew up at a time where they say, women don't wear pants. That's men thing. All sort of things they taught. And we realized it was a lot of cultural things that they forced on the Bible. But now we need to get into the word of God. And if God's word declares truth, are we willing to stand up for that truth? Regardless of what men may say, regardless of how some churches may be pushing us in that direction, no. We're going to stand for that truth. Because, you see, I discovered something. When you stand up for God, he will certainly stand up for us. Amen. Amen, church. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we look at our lives today. There are times we have fallen short. What you expect us to do, we have not followed through. And God, there are times we, we want, as some would say, free ourselves. And so, Lord, we run after strange doctrines. And we fail to realize that our belief system it can do good and it can do a lot of damage. That's why our mind is the battlefield. And so God, the enemy, he's getting people to twist the word. And so God, what we should be believing, we are believing other things. And it's causing a problem in our lives. But God, as ministers of the gospel, we want to be true to you. God, you give us a responsibility and you say, one day, we have to give an account. And so God, I would like, I want that day when I stand before you, you can say, well done, well done. So God, help us to be committed to the truth. Hallelujah. It's not how we feel and how nice it is, but God, the truth. Help us, God. Help us, Lord. Let us have a desire to read, spend time in your word. God, instead of sitting down and in our homes that God will have a desire to come into the house of the Lord and hear the word and study the word of God. Touch us, God. Touch us, Lord. Could we understand, please? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To raise your hands, you go right ahead.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And favor. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. And I want this church to commit ourselves. Let's get up and read. Let's get into the word of God. Amen. Let's get into the word of God. Too many people are just reading Psalms 1. You need to go beyond Psalms 1. Let's get into the word of God. And as you get into the word of God, man. You would want to cry out to God. You would want to speak to God. You would want to talk to Him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We're not going back. Thank you, Jesus. 